I must tell you that (laughs) I got a word this morning. I'm very, very excited about this. I want to jump right into this. I want you to open your Bible to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 20 on down to 40. And the title of my message this morning is The God Who Answers by Fire. The God Who Answers by Fire. Understand that right now there are two churches that are being formed. We have the Great Harlot Church that is being formed. And then we also have the the church that is the Bride of Christ that is being formed. Um, And Jesus, in talking about this, the... uh, the tares being sown in the midst of the wheat, he said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And then the angels will make the separation. But the thing that we have to realize is that this is going on. Everything that has the label church on it is not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether that's denominationally, whether that is individually, we have to see that God is looking for us to, to fall in love with him And to submit our lives totally over to him because there, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So what we want to do is make sure as we're navigating through uh, life and, and mastering the web of Christianity that we don't get stuck in, in various, you know, pitfalls that can arise because Christianity has become so murky. Okay. And so Part of that is from the pulpit, but also it, it also involves us in the congregation also. We have to develop a better appetite and stop just eating everything that comes across the, the plate. And so here is a very powerful prophetic picture of what we see happening in our day. And then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll see, we'll see how this all ties together. In this particular situation, we have Elijah, who is obviously a prophet of God. God has raised him up, powerful man of God. He is dealing with King Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel has got connected to power, got connected to Ahab, and with her evil spirit, she is manipulating behind the scenes to the point to where she has killed the true prophets of God, a lot of true prophets of God. And she is terrorized, and then she's raised up her own brand of religion. She's raised up her own brand of influence, and she accumulated 850 false prophets who ate at her table. And Elijah comes along, the man of God, and he is confronting. So he's, he's outnumbered. And as a result of this, He, in this moment, is standing boldly for the Lord. He's standing in righteousness, and he's confronting Ahab. He's confronting Jezebel. He's confronting the false prophets, and he's making it clear that he's going to stand for righteousness. And how many know we need people like that in this day? We need people like that. So we pick up the story in verse 20. It says in verse 20, So Ahab sent for the children of Israel... And gather the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, Not a word. Now think about this. Instead of them responding, saying, No, The Lord God, he's the Lord. They were faltering between two opinions. Baal, the false god. Baal, I don't want to go too deep into who this particular uh, false god was, but understand that at the end of the day, this particular spirit is obviously being controlled and under the influence of the devil and is getting masses of people to 
worship this particular idol or false god, and as a result, this spirit is controlling masses of people. In this moment, instead of Israel saying, this is not God, the Bible says they answered not a word. Think about that. They answered not a word. Everything that Abraham did, everything that Moses did, everything that Joshua did, everything that they did, they did through the God El Shaddai, Elohim. They, they, they were taught and knew the reality of this particular God, the God that we serve. El Elyon. They, they understood that, but yet in this moment, they're vacillating between two opinions, and instead of them calling out and saying, Baal's not God, they answered not a word. And it just blows my mind that this was their response, knowing their history, and they had documented history. They had the Torah. They understood this is what Moses did. This is the God that brought Moses out, but yet they chose not to answer a word. And I just believe that in this day and age in which we're living, we need to start letting our voices be heard and making it play perfectly clear who we worship, and there is no confusion concerning who we worship. They answered not a word. But look at verses 22 to 24. This is important. He says, Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And actually, there was 400 more of another false god that were a part of this group. He says, Therefore, verse 23, let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now, this is powerful. So he said, let's put it to the test. Now, understand here, saints, that there is a natural aspect of fire that we're going to literally see that is powerful. And it is important for all of us uh, as, we, as we read this through. But, but for us as the church, understand that there is a spiritual aspect of fire that we have to understand. We have to understand the spiritual aspect of it. Because in the mind and the economy of God, fire represents purification. It's, it represents testing. It represents sanctification. It, it represents a detoxing from the world, a purging of the world. And in the midst of the purging and the detoxing, toxification and all those things, there's also a glorification pro that also begins to spring forth as this process is taking place. So when God talks about fire in your life, he's trying to get out of your life all the dross and everything that can hinder the fullness of who you really can be from being manifested. And so fire is not just a bad thing. From a spiritual standpoint, we have to see fire as a good thing because ultimately it brings forth something that God sees in you that is necessary and is a blessing. Not just to you, but also to people that see you. And so what we have to see here is that this fire has... It literally is a fire, but from a spiritual standpoint for us as a church, we have to see that fire, it represents purification. It represents sanctification. It represents what God is trying to do. And as we go further into this, it's going to make more sense as we go forth. But look what he says here in verse 25 all the way to 29. It says, now Elijah said to the, to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. 
So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even, even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. <laughs> I want to stop right here. I got to stop and preach on this just a little bit. Because what happens for all of us, there is a place of, of us um, being anointed by God, empowered by God, and then allowing God to use us. And when you do that, there is a flow that you get into. It, there's a flow that you get into even in your prayer life. Jesus said, don't be like the heathen. When we pray, we don't pray using vain repetition thinking that we'll be heard because of our much speaking. I talked about this last week. And what happens to us is we think that if we do the religious thing, if we do the religious thing, then God's going to respond. If we just keep doing the religious thing, God's going to respond. Understand that, that you and I do not get to where we get to in life by striving. We get to where we get to in life by yielding. You yield to God. And, it, and, God, and then God starts making things happen, and it blows your mind because you're not striving. And I was just talking, I think it was Minister Queen or somebody, I was talking about this. Sometimes when you're looking at people that are anointed by God, it can be very tricky because in, a, in your mind, you think that what they're doing looks easy because they make it look easy because the anointing, the anointing, God's yoke is easy and his burden is light. He, it just flows, right? And so you think, I could do that. But then you try it and you can't. What happens is, is that it's not, it may look easy, but it's not easy. It's the anointing that just makes it look easy. It's the anointing that causes it to flow. It's the anointing that you say, oh man, wow. But people don't realize that that anointing comes with a cost. There's a cost for that. There's a cost for that. In order for the oil to come out of the olive, you have to crush it. And I talked about that last week. You have to crush it. Then, you, then the oil begins to flow. Well, understand that when it comes to this here, these individuals, what are they doing? They're striving. They're jumping. They're dancing. They're going to start cutting themselves. Anything to try to get their God's attention. And for us, this is the reason why I tell you guys all the time, what we do is not a clown show. I don't like clown show Christianity. Well, we're bringing all these props and we're doing all this stuff and, and trying to do all this striving to try to make it happen. We have to trust that the word of God has power, it works, that the anointing is going to flow, that the grace is going to happen, and that the spirit of God just begins to move. And in doing that, we don't have to do all these gimmicks like the world does. Can I have an amen, y'all? We don't have to do all the gimmicks like the world does. And our, sometimes our creativity can get us into trouble. And in this moment, these guys are doing all kinds of stuff to get the God that they serve to move. But Elijah comes along, he starts mocking them because they're putting on this whole show and nothing is happening. Saints, this is not an entertainment center. I'm not putting on a show for nobody. We're going to hear the word of God, respond to the word of God. We're going to worship God. We're going to serve people. We're going to love people. We're going to honor God. And then the Holy Spirit just comes in. And then he, man, I, I like this. And the Holy Spirit just comes in and then he starts moving. He's the one that puts on a show. You look, out, you look at this and watch what happens. Look at verse 30, y'all. Then Elijah said to the people, 
Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took the 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And then he says uh, in verse, let's go to verse 33, and he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. I want to just stop right here, saints. Look at verse 30, y'all. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. i got to stop here. Because this is one of our problems with Christianity. Christianity is not just about the new. Christianity is is founded upon the old. This is what I'm saying. The problem that we have in today's Christianity is that people are always looking for something new. They're always looking for something fresh. They're always looking for, so, so and, and because their inspiration isn't coming from the Lord all the time, then what we do is we, we start copying what we see happening in the marketplace with the movie theaters and with the concerts, the secular concerts and, and all these other things. And we think that those are the things that are going to generate excitement. Not realizing that our greatest strength is found in the foundation that has already been laid that in some cases has been broken down. So what does he do in this moment? He doesn't disregard that which was broken down. The first thing he does is he repairs the altar that was broken. He goes back to that which was of old. He goes back to that which was necessary. And that's, I want to say this to all you young people in this room. If you are a young person in this room, young man, young woman, you're growing up. You have saints that have gone before you. There is an aspect of new that is good and it is a blessing. But in your search for new, don't disregard that which is old. The old saints are going to be able to tell you things that are necessary for you to have sex success as you go forward. And don't despise the older people. And let me say this, and older people don't despise the youth. Abraham needs Isaac, and Isaac needs Jacob. So God is a generational God, and so he doesn't want a break in the generations. He wants a continuation. So we have to see that which is old and take a hold of that and then use that for the glory of God. In this moment, Elijah doesn't despise that which was old. In fact, he repairs it so that he can build what God is wanting him to build that ultimately the fire is going to consume. And this is what happens for us as a church community. I'm always, I like talking to older saints that have been down the road a little bit and extract knowledge and wisdom and insight from them because they can help me as I'm going down the road to make sure that I don't hit any pitfalls that I don't need to hit. You younger people, listen to your, your godly parents. Listen to the people. Go and talk to some older people and say, I want you to speak into my life to help me so that I can grow and I can be a man of God and a woman of God. These are the things that we need. But what happens in, now, the altar is torn down and we say, oh, that's trash. Let's just build another one. Churches have been successful for years, and men of God have laid the foundation. But some of this new breed of preacher, they want to be slick. 
and hip. Look at my Gucci. Look at my Louis. Look how fancy I am. Look at my props. Look at my this. Look at my that. And the simplicity of our devotion to Christ has got muddied in the water. And instead of us serving God the way he wants to be served, we're, we're serving in the way that we feel will generate excitement. But I love this. Elijah, he understood this concept. So what does he do? He goes forth in verse 30. He says, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He repaired that which had been. And then in verse 36, look what happens. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's Jacob. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Sixty-three words he prayed. He wasn't jumping around. He wasn't cutting himself. He wasn't gyrating. He wasn't calling on this. He wasn't all this stuff that people are doing. He wasn't making props. He wasn't going off and, and thinking we got to have a light show and make this place like a, a, some kind of clown show. He wasn't doing all that. His relationship with God, his intimacy with God, his knowledge of God's ways caused him to align himself with the purpose of God. And as a result of this, as he prayed 63 words, the fire, God responded and brought forth fire and licked up the sacrifice. Understand that that's the nature of the relationship that we want to have with God. We don't want to be striving. We want to yield. And then God, and then we allow God to deal with the with the, um, the results, and the results will be powerful if we're willing to align ourselves with God's purpose and not just chasing after our own desires and dreams. God will come through and he'll answer your prayers, and we, just like we prayed earlier, but we have to allow him to answer it his way. Fire comes down and consumes this, and all it took, all it took in this moment was 63 words. Sixty-three words. There's no striving in that. There's peace in that. And then the God who answers by fire, he, he, he releases his fire. And that becomes a sign of confirmation, a sign of revelation. Now, earlier I told you all that this is literal fire, but for us spiritually, this sign of fire is consecration, purification, holiness. It is, it is a detoxification. It is a removing of the draws. It is a making, it is a making this sacrifice gets consumed with this fire and it gets transformed. Well, in our personal lives, we have to see, and I, and I said this to my wife last night when I was just thinking about this. I said, the most amazing things about Christianity that I love, I said, honey, we have to understand that the devil can't make you holy. When I gave my life to God, I didn't, I didn't come to God because I didn't come to God because I, I was, I felt down and out. I came to God because I was up and out. 
I had the money. I'm 22 years old. I'm a millionaire, multimillionaire, 22 years old. And I've been that way ever since. I had the money. I had the cars, houses. I could get whatever I wanted. I, people knew my name. They know my name all over the place. I walked through Seattle. It's, when I go there now, it's still it's crazy. All those things. But when I would look in the mirror, I would look and i say, something's wrong with you. I knew that something like in me was wrong. That like, man, how come I, certain things I wanted to stop, I couldn't stop. Certain things I wanted to do, I, I just couldn't do because I didn't have any power. And I, and I would try to suppress it, to press it, so I would make myself feel better or suppress it. But at the end of the day, I would go back to it and I would be frustrated. I'm like, why does this keep happening? Why? I'm still, I still feel bad. I'm riddled with guilt and shame. I know I'm not living right. When I heard the gospel and I heard that Jesus could transform you, that he can do, man, I'm feeling this, that he can do a work on the inside of you, that he could do something in me, that something in me could change, it blew my mind because a lot of times when you hear Christianity, it's just about, oh, geez, what Jesus did in shedding his blood and forgiving you of your sins. I don't want my sins just to be forgiven. I want to be changed. I want to be changed. I... Oh, God, thank you for forgiving me my sins. Now change me. Get anger out of my life. Get lust out of my life. Get prayer out of my life. Get worry out of my life. Get stress, unforgiveness, bitterness, whatever. Get it all out of me. I don't want that in my life. And when I heard the message and the power of God that this is what God could do, I said, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I need to hear. But in hearing this, I clearly understood that there was an aspect of fire that was going to be necessary to burn out all the dross. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, this is what we're going to read here. It's so important because Understand, saints of God, that I made the statement, the devil, he can't make you holy. He can't make you holy. But what he can do is he can give you a car. He can give you a house. He can give you a spouse. He can give you, he can give you things that in the mind of humans we think is the greatest values. But how many know that all of that is this filthy rags, y'all? And so he can, he can put your name in the paper, and he can blow you up, and he can make you popular, and he can do all those things, but he can't make you holy. He can't make you righteous. He can't make you loving. He can't make you trustworthy. He can't make you faithful. He can't make you, he can't bring forth the fruit of God's spirit in you. Because he has no ability to do so. But he promises you all the kingdoms of this world, but he can't change your life and make you more like Jesus. But when Jesus gets a hold of us, saints, what does he do? He, he will bless us with all those things. And those things are a blessing. And he will let you have them, but he teaches you not to let those things have you. And so what ends up happening here is that the, the true God, the God that is the real God, once again, in the New Testament, he answers by fire. He answers by fire. And what you do is proven by fire. Look what it says here in verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth. He's talking about how watering the seed, working, and he's warning, and he's telling us about how carnality 
It could get in and it stops the growth of God's people. But in verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is who, y'all? Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, is no different than what Elijah did. There's an altar here. I got to repair it because this is the foundation. I can build on it and then God's going to cause the fire to come, but I cannot neglect that which has already been laid. And so this is why this is up here on the wall. Because I never want, no matter how, whatever building we have, whatever happens, I don't want, I want people to realize the simplicity of this. Because this is the foundation. And I want it to be always of, of before us that we're looking unto Jesus. We're not looking unto, we're looking unto Jesus. We're not trying to be the most popular church. We're not trying to go out here and, and, and make a name for ourselves and do all this sort of stuff and to blow up. I'm not, the pastor isn't, he's not God. Jesus is Lord. We're looking unto Jesus. We're, this ain't about how good our worship team is and how many children's church and all this other stuff. Do I feel Jesus when I come into this building? Do I feel Jesus when I come into the church? When they start singing, do I feel Jesus? When pastor walks up to preach, is Jesus with them? That's the stuff that we have to start thinking. So here, we see very clearly here, there's no other foundation but that which is been laid. We have to go back to the altar that has already been built. We got to get back to him. We got to repair it. We got to get back to that because that is going to be, it's going to spring forth and cause everything else to take place. Look what it says in verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, Silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day. Now, look at there. There's a capital D. So that day speaks of the period of time. It speaks of a period of time. And it, ultimately, it speaks of judgment. He says the day will declare it because it will be revealed by what, y'all? And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive what? <laughs> and so, so like I said earlier, fire speaks of purification, sanctification, righteousness. It speaks of holiness. It speaks of testing. The God that we serve, he answers by fire. He answers by fire. Your work is going to be tested by fire. God is purifying you. And some of you are saying, I don't know why I'm going through this trial. I'm going through this test. And I sit back and say, you, you go, God may be turning up the heat. Just stay in the cooker. You're going to come out even better than you were before. I don't understand what's happening. The devil is busy. Not every test you have or trouble you have is from the devil. Sometimes the God is saying, God is saying, I want to see you more holy like me. Let me just turn up the fire on your job a little bit. Can I have an amen, y'all? And sometimes the fire hurts, but God wants you to be gold. He wants you to be silver. He wants you to be a precious stone. He doesn't want you to be wood, hay, and stubble. He wants you to be something that has been tested through the fire, and that fire has purified you. And now when you look at yourself in the mirror, Napoleon Kaufman, you can say, I'm not that man I used to be that I was worrying about all those years ago because that man now then got himself together, and I may have a house, I may have a car, but I got some holiness and righteousness on the inside of me, and God done changed my life, and I ain't cussing and fussing and messing around no more because God... God came in and did what I could not do. I'm not crying no more saying I need to be changed. I'm saying, God, I thank you that you worked the change in me and you put a love down in my soul and you cannot have an amen. 
Somebody look at your neighbor and tell them the fire works. You, you watch God work in your life and move in your life. Now, but understand that in this process is God is working and the fire is working in your life. Realize that you never want to get to a place where you assume that you're good now. Somebody asked me this question years ago. We were in a leadership meeting and they asked me this question. Uh, she said, Pastor, do you think that you're doing a, a good job as a pastor? Do you think that God is pleased with you? And I, it was, it was kind of funny to me when she asked me this question, but I, I just kind of chuckled within myself. And I said, well, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know. I said, I think I'm doing okay. And... I'm trying, you know, to do what's right in the sight of God. I'm hopeful. But at the end of the day, I won't know until I stand before him. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, I feel the presence of God. I feel the grace of God on my life. I feel the anointing of God. I see God you know, doing various things, but at the end of the day, I don't assume that I'm good now. Because a person who does that, then you're on the road to destruction. We are never to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly. So I try to be sober around that because I don't want to assume that, oh, I'm good. Me and, me and God, we, we, <laughs> we, we cool, we good. No, I'm like, no, I don't know. I hope so, man. Praise God. I'm praying. I'm seeking God. I'm, I'm trying to live right. I'm, I'm trying to, because I don't want to ever look and, and think to myself where you've arrived when I'm not the one who is the judge of that. Can I have an amen? All of us are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive in our body what we have done, whether good or evil. So there's a place for understanding that, hey, I don't want to ever feel like I got it all together and that I don't need God. So that's what I told her in the meeting. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying. Now, you may all be all good, but I know I need God in my life. Can I have an amen? amen? And here we see that everyone's work is going to be tested by the fire. And it's the God who answers by fire that is going to test your work. He's going to test. He's going to allow you to go through some mess and test, but then he's also in the process, if we're willing to respond right and let it happen, he's going to purify He's going to remove the dross. He's going, to, he's going to, I love when God does this, and this is important. He's going to get rid of some people in your life that need to be out of your life. And he's going to bring the right people in your life that need to be in your life. Do yourself a favor and let God pick your friends. Can I have an amen? And as you do that, as you allow God to do that, what happens? This purification process begins to take course and begins to flow in your life. And the God who answers by fire, his goal is not to destroy you, it's to show you where you're really at and then ultimately to perfect you if you're willing to allow that to happen. And it doesn't take striving. It doesn't take Jumping up and down. It doesn't take cutting yourself. It doesn't take doing all these things that the prophets of Baal did. Elijah paid 63 words and the fire came down, consumed the altar. And that, now whoo, watch this y'all. Now, And that was the sign that the God that they served was real. Hear what I'm saying. We think a person... We think God is God solely on the basis of us, him blessing us with another house. We think God is God solely on the basis of him giving you a new job. Which those things are a blessing. 
We shout over that too. But that's not just the sign that God is God in your life. Because the devil can do those things too. But what the devil can't do, and let me say it again, is the devil can't make you holy. He can't make you righteous. His fire, he don't have the fire to come down and purify you. And we need to start looking at that as a sign that, wait a minute, the true God that is real is really real in my life. How you know? Because he made me righteous. He helped me stop lying. He helped me stop cussing. He helped me put the drugs down. He helped me put the alcohol down. He helped me. He helped me stop looking at these pornos. He helped me get away from my hands are clean now. He helped me get away from running with, with, with Junebug and them at the club and going over to Sweet Jimmy's. He helped me. He, he got this stuff out of my life. He broke some things. He helped me to be humble. He helped me to listen to counsel. <laughs> I'm feeling this right now. He helped get some pride out of my life. He helped get that anger and bitterness out of my life. He helped me to forgive my mama. He helped me to forgive my daddy. He helped me to forgive my cousin. He helped me to get that. He started changing my heart. He helped me to stop cussing out my coworkers. He helped me to stop cussing out my boss. He helped me to, can I have an amen? And that's the God that answers by fire. He purifies me. He makes me white as snow. He helps to rejuvenate and revive me. He helps to sanctify me. He helps me to think good thoughts <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> man I want to run through this I praise God for the money I praise God for the blessings of houses and cars and all these other things but I, I thank God that I'm not the person on the inside that I used to be because God lit a fire inside and he purged me And I didn't have to jump. I didn't have to cut myself. I didn't have to scream all night. I didn't have to do all this gyration. I just had to get on my knees and say, Lord, I need you. I need you in my life. I need you to change my heart, change my mind, change my will, change my spirit. Change me, Lord. I need help. I need you. I just need God. Lord, move in my life. And then God started lighting the fire and he starts pure. Somebody need to praise God this morning. <laughs> I feel the anointing on this. Somebody need to give God the glory. Because it wasn't your house that saved you. It wasn't your money that saved you. It wasn't even your mama. It wasn't your daddy. It was God the most high who answers by fire. And he purifies you. Whew, I feel the anointing. Go ahead and give God some praise. <laughs> We serve a God that answers by fire, y'all. But look what he doesn't stop here. He doesn't stop. Look at verse 16. If anyone's work which he has done is built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through what, y'all? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. The devil hates it when you Catch hold of this revelation. That all of the, the gyrations and all the, just the religious stuff isn't the answer. It's the God who answers by fire, allowing his fire to purify all the dross and to work out the wood, the hay, and the stubble, uh, stubble so you can become gold, silver, and precious stone. That when you walk down the street, the essence of who God has made you, it speaks louder than anything that God can just give you as a sign of success. 
You're not successful because you have a bunch of stuff and God has blessed you with those things. Those things are nice. You're successful because you've been transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ from glory to glory. And a good saint is able to see that. Man, that's a holy woman of God. She's powerful. That's a mighty man of God. Look at that, brother. Man, he really is on fire for God. That, oh man, you see them kids, them youth, they're, they're really living for God. We have to start redefining, once again, or going back to the old altar of success. And repair that. Because the old saints, they weren't thinking like that. They weren't thinking video boards and all this other stuff. They were thinking, where's God at? And then you look up now, and those things are a blessing. We, we, we thank God for, for some of those things, but understand that that becomes the sign. You shall know them by their fruit. You see the fruit of God's Spirit in them, and those are individuals that have allowed the fire to come, to purge and to quench and to, and to bring forth revelation. And so we saw what Elijah, it didn't take striving, it took yielding. And he prayed, and then God says, I got your back. The church, we don't think that we can accomplish the task of souls being saved, people being, you know, regenerate, regenerated, and all these other things without putting on some fancy show when it's just the simplicity of our prayer life, our consecration, our holiness. Our love for God and being consistent with that. And then God, he begins to answer by fire. And that is the sign of the true and living God. It's not how big our building is. The sign is much simpler than that. And we have to be able to see it. The world is getting darker. And the show is going on. And the Antichrist is going to deceive people with signs and lying wonders. He's going to come across real good and eloquent. And he's going to look the part externally. And he may have all the phylactery. But when Jesus came on the scene, his problem was not with how the the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked externally. He was concerned about how they looked internally. You're not holy. You're not living right. And the God who answers by fire, you're not calling upon him. You're calling upon someone that can materialistically satisfy your insatiable desire. But, have, but you haven't, you're full of dead men's bones. This is what Jesus said. And so what happens for us is, woe be it to us as a church and as a community, if Jesus comes back, And all we have to offer him is we prayed a little bit, we went to church, we gave the church some money, and we sung some songs every now and then, and, 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 you know, and we have a nice building. Praise the Lord. Jesus is coming back for people that look and act like him. Can I have it a bit? Can I have it a bit? He's looking for bone in my bone. And flesh of my flesh. How many brides of Christ? Do I have some brides of Christ? He's looking for bone in my bone and flesh of my. <laughs> He's looking for bone in my bone and flesh of my flesh. I died. I died. I bled. And I gave my life so that you can become like me. Because he's not trying to be unequally yoked, y'all. He's trying to, he's coming back for a pride that is without spot and without what y'all wrinkle. And he's trying, he's going to find her. And he might find her, he might find a little bit of them in the well. He might find a little bit of them over at this church and that church. But he's trying to find his bride. And they might be scattered in amongst some wolves. They might be scattered in amongst some wheat. But he's going to go hunting for his bride. And I want to make sure that everybody in this church, when he cracks the sky, we say, I'm ready. Because I, because I let the fire hit my life. And I have received the fire. And I'm serving the God that answers by fire. 
Saints, this is the war that's going on. And at the end of the day, allow God to continue to purify and purge you on the inside. The same way that Elijah called down fire and that altar was purified and it was lapped up. All the water, everything. Because God is the God who answers by fire. And when you feel yourself in a moment where you say, Pastor, I'm in the fire. Saints, trust me. You lift up your hands and say, God, I trust you. You are purifying me and you are making me more like you. And God, I trust you. And I, all my work is going to be tested by fire. Pull out anything in my life that could cause wood, hay, or stubble. I want the pure gold, silver, precious stone. I want you, God, to purify my life. And when God is taking you, when God allows us to go through moments like this, understand that the moment is working for you and in you something that you may have never got if you just hung around church and just played church. Submit to that process and then allow God to finish his work in your life because his ultimate desire, saints, is for you to be transformed into his image from glory to glory. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen? Everybody stand to your feet this morning. We have so many people that are new in this church, and I want to share this story that some of you have heard for years. I'm saved. I'm walking with God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. By this time, I'm prophesying. I'm casting out devils, and the power of God is moving. I'm still playing for the Raiders, and as I'm there in the offseason, I will go off and I'll preach all over the country. And God was still dealing with me about certain things. And as he's dealing with me, I'm having this wrestling match on, on the job. And I'm saying, Lord, please fire all these people. Here. Oh, Lord, fire them. Has anybody, has anybody ever been in a situation like that? It's like, well, get rid of him, him, him. I'm, I'm going around, and I'm saying, get rid of everybody. God, you on my side. All of a sudden, I can remember um, they brought in a new running back. John Gruden brought in a new running back named Tyrone Wheatley, and he was, he was a good running back. I loved him. He was a good, we were good friends and everything. And then as the season went on, they started phasing me out and making me second. And they started letting him run the ball more. And I was watching this situation unfold right before my eyes. And I knew what was going on, but it wasn't being communicated to me. And so I would go home. i say, Lord, you see what's going on? Fire him. And I just remember, saints, I remember going through that whole process. And then eventually, uh, John did come to me, say, we're going to use him to pound the ball a little bit more and whatnot. And so I kind of got phased into number two. And, but I'm still getting the ball. I'm balling. I'm averaging five yards a carry. And I'm, I'm, I'm not getting hit as much as he is. So I'm still like... Praise the Lord, you know what I mean? <laughs> Keep giving me those checks, you know what I mean? So, one time there was a lady, um, Shirley, who, she saw me on the, on the uh, sideline. The camera came and it just showed me on the sideline and I had my head down and I was just kind of staring. And she called me after the game. And she said, uh, Napoleon, I saw your game today. You guys did so good, you know, and you did good. She said, but I saw you. And I said, really? I said, what'd you think? And she said, God is trying to kill you. And I knew exactly what she meant. 
And I said, I know, I know, I know what God is doing. But I'm just going to submit to the process and watch God do what he's going to do. And she's like, I, I just thought I should tell you that. That's what I see. So I thank you. Well, I kind of thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about my But I understood. And sometimes in our lives, we got to see that this fire, when it comes, it's, it's, I didn't see it. I realized this wasn't a bad thing. I had always been first. God had to show me how to be second and keep a smile on my face, cheer somebody else on. I, I last asked God to bless them and want God use their life and God help him to do good in his life, help, help him to score a touchdown. And the, and the change my thought to get all the self out and start pushing somebody else and that was fire but it was the the God who answers by fire what is he doing he's purifying me and every single one of us have to start seeing this is God's work it is marvelous in my eyes I'm going to continue to let God do what he's doing in my life because I don't want the God that when I pray he doesn't answer I want the God that when I pray, he answers by fire. Can I have an amen? Father, we pray this morning that God, you would continue to work your work in us as individuals, as us as a church, as us as families. Lord, that as, as singles, that in every area of this church, as widows, as seniors, every aspect of the church that you would continue to be the God that answers by fire in our lives God we refuse to worship the God of this age the devil and all the various false gods that he's erected to get people to be to gravitate towards him we will serve you and we will give you all the glory we want the God that answers by fire in our lives. Purify us and make us like you every single day. And Father, I pray this morning that as we pray, you would answer us and you would perform your wondrous works in our hearts and in our minds. God, we give you all the glory. You are the God, the only God that answers by fire. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. If you're in this room this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm going through some fire, I want you to come to the altar right now. We're going to pray that God will perfect you, that the Spirit of God will continue to keep you, and that God would finish His work in your life and bring closure in your life. If that is you and you say, Pastor, that's exactly where I'm at. Well, here is a moment to respond to say, Pastor, let, I want God to do his work in my life. Come on down to the altar. Altar workers, come on, let's find some people and let's believe God. Let's believe God with them. Let's touch and agree that God will complete his work in their lives and be glorified. God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. Everyone else, come on, let's come down and pray and believe God.